este unul dintre cei mai importanți și cunoscuți lideri spirituali ai lumii. Deep gratitude for having given us Este cel de al 141-lea patriarh al Ierusalimului, succesorul Sfântului Apostol Iacov, Ruda Domnului. The apostolic uh, succession has its origins here in uh, the holy city of Jerusalem. Dintre conducătorii celorlalte biserici care slujesc la Sfântul Mormânt este singurul care intră și se roagă în Sfântul Mormânt pentru coborârea Sfintei Lumii. Everybody has his own service in his own customs and his own language, right? And this is the beauty of it. This is real ecumenical spirit, that is to say, to respect and accept the other. Ca punct de întâlnire între Dumnezeu și om, cetatea veche a Ierusalimului impresionează, copleșește, dar și tulbură totodată. You have a inner freedom and a peace. Dincolo de fiecare piatră și loc pe unde a pășit Mântuitorul, am vrut să-L cunoaștem pe singurul om din lume în mâinile căruia Sfânta Lumină se aprinde an de an la Sfântul Mormânt. Emoțiile inerente unui astfel de moment aerul solemn al Palatului Patriarhiei Ierusalimului, dar mai ales zâmbetul prefericirii sale vor rămâne pentru totdeauna în memoria noastră și în mulțumiri către Dumnezeu. Nu întâlnirea în sine este cea care ne-a impresionat din prima clipă. Nu. Mai sunt atâția oameni primiți în audiență de Patriarhul Ierusalimului. Altceva ne-a câștigat inima. Căldura, lumina și speranța răspândite de omul care, prin ceea ce este și prin ceea ce tăruiește, devine patriarhul oamenilor și alesul lui Dumnezeu. Așa l-am întâlnit la reședința sa din Ierusalim. Your gratitude, thank you very much to joining us. It's a blessing for us to see you and meet you here in the Holy Land. Since we are so close to the Holy Sepulchre, I would like to start by asking you, Father Patriarch, how does it feel to stand in the very place where Jesus was crucified, buried and resurrected from the dead? Well, uh, first of all, we are most welcome. Thank you for this uh, meeting here. It is true that uh, Jerusalem is a very special place and uh, because Jerusalem is uh, connected with the place of the crucifixion and of course of the burial and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, I mean his uh, tomb. It is true that uh, Jerusalem, I mean the Holy Sepulchre is the heart of uh, Jerusalem from the Christian point of view. And uh, this is due to the fact that this part of the earth, I mean Jerusalem itself, has a unique privilege to have been uh, blessed and therefore uh, sanctified by the redeeming blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of His uh, Passion and His Crucifixion. And secondly is that this part of the earth has uh, hosted in her bosom the very body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, someone who is uh, living here, she feels that she has a very special blessing. And uh, for me, uh, it's something that uh, is something existential. And this is the fact that uh, I've been here since my childhood, and uh, I grew up in here. Not just I grew up in Jerusalem, but also uh, once I was uh, made a monk and then ordained as a deacon, then my first service was uh, in the Holy uh, Sepulchre, that is to say, 
in the tomb of our Lord Jesus uh, Christ. And um, I mean, it's something that you cannot describe. What you can uh, express and you can describe is that uh, being here, you feel that you are always in contact with uh, reality. And our reality is uh, that uh, God made man for our uh, freedom, for our salvation, for our eternity. Nearby is the Church of the Resurrection, which is considered to be the geographical and spiritual center of the world. Why is it considered so? First of all, geographically speaking, uh, Jerusalem is in the center of the globe, right? And uh, secondly, uh, the Holy Sepulchre is in the center of centers of the globe. This is why in our uh, Catholicon, that is the part of the church, the Gostadinian part of the church that we hold our uh, services and ceremonies, this part is called the, the middle of the world. Why it is called the middle of the world? Because it is in between the distance of uh, the crucifixion, Golgotha, and the burial, I mean the tomb of our Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Your Beatitude, what is the place of Jerusalem in salvation history and in the hierarchy of apostolic thrones? Well, uh, one has to bear in mind that uh, here was uh, established the church and uh, it was not just established but uh, the church here in Jerusalem was, has been established upon the very redeeming blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unlike the other churches that have been built up and established uh, on the Kirugma, that is to say on the words of the uh, apostles. Then uh, one has to bear in mind that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, he, is, uh, he has the uh, prophetic uh, uh, capacity, also the archpastoral capacity, which means he is uh, the chief, the high priest, right? And uh, it was here that the first bishop was ordained, St. James, the brother of God, was uh, ordained by our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the apostolic uh, succession has its origins here in uh, the holy city of Jerusalem. Your Beatitude, every Christian's dream is to visit at least once in his life the holy places, especially Jerusalem, the city called City of Peace. But once in Jerusalem, uh, whatever you see, whatever you encounter, whatever you experience, the peace is not the only thing you can do. Your Beatitude, you can't tell the story of Jerusalem without considering its two main protagonists, the Jewish and the Muslims. I would like to ask you, Father Patriarch, what is so special about this city that it's a magnet for all the monotheistic religions? Why do they all claim exclusivity over Jerusalem. You will know that God cannot be possessed. God belongs to everyone. This is true. I mean, uh, what is uh, characteristic of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ is that he is the one who gave his blood for the salvation of the whole world. That is to say, he is the righteous one. I mean, in, in the world history, there are many great uh, spiritual figures and religious personalities, right? But none of them sacrifice himself for the whole world. Everybody made some sacrifice, but for his own people, for his own reasons. But it is only Jesus Christ that he gave the, his blood for the whole world. This is why he is the righteous one, correct? Correct. Now, the other thing is that uh, here is the, the place of the uh, divine human encounter, right? 
And what is important and characteristic of the Holy Land, and of course Jerusalem as well, is the fact that here you have the so-called sacred geography. Sacred geography is connected with the sacred history. And what is the sacred history? Is the history of salvation, is the history of the revelation, that is to say the history of the Bible, of the Old and the New Testament. Many people, including Christians, right, they do have doubts about the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. They can accept him as a historical person, as a human being, like a prophet, right? But some of them, they have difficulties believing in his uh, divinity. Now, what is important here is the f what makes this place to be so significant is that nobody can deny the historicity and the authenticity and the truth about the sacred history. Why? Because whatever is written in the Bible, it's not something abstract. It's not a myth. It's not an inventiveness, but it is a reality. And the re this reality is confirmed by natural and physical uh, evidences. And this is geography. At the Holy Sepulchre in October 2016, one of the greatest events of last century took place. The Holy Tomb of Jesus was examined for the first time in history. What important discoveries were made? How did you feel when the Holy Tomb of Jesus was examined archaeologically for the first time? No, it's not for the first time. I mean, uh, for the first uh, time there was of hundreds of years, there was, uh, took place the restoration of the edicule, which covers the holy tomb, right? And also, after thousands of years, the tomb itself was opened. Now, many scholars, they have uh, developed all sorts of uh, histories and theories whether is it the original one or not, is this the Constantinian uh, place, right? Is the authentic place of the tomb, etc. We ourselves and myself, I never had any uh, doubt because we've been living here, we have experience, uh, we know that this part, that the Holy Land in general and the Holy Tomb itself is uh, a source of divine energy and many miracles have taken place. Many people, they were healed, right? So this time it was about time to proceed for the restoration. And of course, part of the restoration was to remove, to open uh, the tomb of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, the scientists, uh, discover that whatever uh, has been written about from various uh, sources, from many writers, that it was uh, authentic. And this was a great, great uh, uh, event because the academic and scholarly community, now they have uh, accepted and admitted that this is the authentic place of the tomb of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have given to us a very clear and touching testimony. Thank you. What does the resurrection mean for the whole creation and why is it the most important feast of Christianity? Well, St. Paul gives the answer. St. Paul says that uh, if the resurrection of our Lord Jesus hasn't taken place, then our faith would be in vain. Right? I mean, the basis of the of Christian faith, of the Christian gospel, is precisely this, the resurrection. Why? Because uh, the human uh, entity, the human being, is not just 
a biological existence. There is something additional. And this something additional is the soul, is the inner part of the human being, right? And the soul is not subject to corruption and death. Our body is subject to corruption and death, right? And therefore, Christ he himself proved to us, he spoke about our eternity. And therefore, he says, I am the light, I am the resurrection. And, this is, and also St. Paul says that uh, here on this earth, uh, in our current life, we're just um, immigrants, passerbys. We have no permanent city here. We have permanent city in heaven, right? Since the Holy Light is the most visible miracle that happens every year yeah. at the Holy Church uh, on the Saturday before Easter, how do you feel to know that you are the only Christian in the world in whose hands the Holy Light is lit? It's a very special uh, event. It's very important because uh, the ceremony of the Holy Light on uh, uh, Good Saturday is um, preparation, right? For and to show in advance to people about the coming of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we talk about resurrection, we talk about the light of the resurrection. And therefore, before we attain to the vision of the glorious uh, resurrection, the glorious light of our Lord, we have the, which is the noetic life, we have to see, to touch before that the physical light. How do you prepare Father Patriarch for the ceremonial descent of the Holy Light? We know that you enter alone the Holy Sepulchre, right. no one sees what you do there. The question plugging every Christian's mind and beyond is how does the Holy Light fall? The thing is, is that in the Orthodox Church, you know, everything uh, is uh, crystal clear. There are no secrets. I don't know. No, there are no secrets. Uh, but for us, the Holy Light is uh, like the Divine Eucharist, right? Which means the Divine Eucharist is made of natural elements. You have wine and you have bread that are blessed and are transubstantiated. They becoming the, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, according to your own inner spiritual preparation and situation, right? You have the experience of receiving those holy and divine elements. So the same is with the holy light, which is really something very unique uh, because the holy light, uh, when it comes out, uh, does not burn and uh, thousands of people, they touch it, and they never had any problem. And uh, throughout the ages, never, for almost 2,000 years, never, never a fire happened because of the Holy Light in the Holy Sepulchre. Does the light of the Holy Sepulchre represent the experience of uncreated light? Yes, it does. That means that you are holy if from your hands the holy light comes? I mean, nobody is holy, perfect. Only our Lord Jesus Christ is the holy one. We are uh, humans and we are uh, subject to our uh, weaknesses, right? And our human weaknesses and to our, and to our createdness. Right? 
But St. Paul says something very important. He says that in my weakness, right, God works his miracle. Your Beatitude, how old are the relations of um, Patriarchate of Jerusalem with the Romanian Patriarchate? Well, the very moment that the uh, Christianity was spread over in uh, the, in the area of Romania, uh, and there was established uh, the official uh, Orthodox Church. Then, since that time, the relationship starts. Most of the time, you are seen serving or welcoming pilgrims in all conditions. How do you manage to carry out all of your duties and responsibilities with such love and passion? Well, uh, it's a good question, right? I mean, this is our mission. And uh, you have to be committed. And uh, I have, uh, I'm very sensitive to this matter, especially to pilgrims, because um, from experience, I know what is to be a pilgrim and a pilgrim of the Holy Land. As you said before, Many people, they are dreaming to come here. And not only this, but many people that financially cannot afford, they're just trying to collect some money, right? Uh, in order to make possible to realize, to implement their dream. I had the opportunity to serve a community in Cana of Galilee. And uh, there is a holy place. It's this Cana of Galilee is connected with the first miracle that our Lord Jesus Christ did with the blessing of the wedding and the change of water into wine, right? So there is a community. And I used to receive uh, pilgrims, right? And this made me understand what is to be a pilgrim and what the pilgrim expects from the Holy Land and of course from the spiritual leaders, whether we talk about priests, patriarchs, etc. From the perspective of your mission, how difficult is to speak today to the people about God in a world where it's increasingly difficult to penetrate the Word of God. Do you feel it's more difficult to communicate the message now than in previous periods, or has each period had its challenges? You are right. I mean, uh, no, I don't have any difficulty. On the contrary, when you meet with people, right, and uh, you talk to them, and uh, all of a sudden, you realize that uh, everybody who is coming here and everybody who is approaching the Patriot, uh, he has his own reason. Nobody so far can say that he's been here without any motivation. So I try to discover, but I challenge people and ask them, what is your motivation? What has brought you here? Is it faith? Is uh, out of curiosity? Is it uh, just you want to see what's happening here because of the political situation, etc., etc., right? And then you realize, I mean, you have to see every human being, right? To see him first and foremost as a human being, correct? And uh, therefore, this is the way that you manage to find the language of communication. And then, once you establish communication, then <laughs> you can talk about God. <laughs> At the Holy Sepulchre, there are Orthodox, Catholics, and Copts, and Armenians, and they are in a great kind of community. Right. And there are Muslims, 
nearby. What do you think your attitude is the secret of um, why ecumenism works in its pure and ideology-free sense? Talking about uh, Holy the Sepulchre and the, ver and the presence of the various community, it's something very uh, touching and very important because today there is confusion in many people. They do not distinguish between ecumenism and ecumenical. I myself am against any kind of ecumenism. I'm not an ecumenist, but I am ecumenical. And I take pride of the fact that the real, true ecumenical spirit exists in the Holy Sepulchre. Why? Because there you have the various Christian uh, denominations, communities, as you said. You have the Franciscans, the Armenians, the Copts, the Syriacs, the Abyssinians, Ethiopians, and uh, the Orthodox. Correct? Now, what is important characteristic of it is that everybody has his own service in his own customs, in his own language, right? And this is the beauty of it. This is real ecumenical spirit, that is to say, to respect and accept the other, right? Not try to impose your own belief or your own, as you said, the ideology to the others, right? and not to confuse things. I would like to ask you, Father Patriarch, about the quality of monastic life in, in this area, because we know that um, the region of Palestine, Lake Tiberias, um, places around Jerusalem and Bethlehem, the wilderness of Judea, were like a magnet for many monks before. Do monks still exist today? Do monks still retreat into caves? Yes, they do. I mean, a few days ago, I went to celebrate the Divine Liturgy, the Monastery of St. Gerasimus, which is nearby the Jordan uh, River. And I had to prepare a sermon, so uh, I went through a book, The History of uh, Monasticism in the, the Holy Land, in Palestine which is written by a great saint, Cyril of Scythopolis. And uh, it is true what uh, has been said about monasteries in the Holy Land. There were thousands of monks and many, many monasteries, both in the Judean desert and the area, the wilderness of uh, the Jordan River. And uh, thank God today we have some monastic communities. One of them, and the most important, the famous one, is the monastic community of St. Saba, the Sanctified. And there you have monastic life since fourth century, and goes until today uh, without any hindrance, without any change. And then we have some other monastic centers. One of them is uh, the St. George the Hojevite, right? That there also we have uh, the relics of saints and of course the relic, the full body, the whole body of uh, St. John the Hojevite, the Romanian one, that he is a miracle worker. And there is a very uh, good monastic uh, community there. I would like to ask you a personal question. Please. Since we are in land, how do you live your repentance as a preparation for the resurrection? Well, you know, right now our church is, I mean, uh, holding the great fast, the Lent period, right? And, uh, you know, here in our Patriarchate, we are also a monastic uh, order and uh, we live uh, like uh, other monks. I mean, our responsibility is not just monastic, but are also uh, pastoral. But however, here we hold all the services, and therefore this is part and parcel of our uh, uh, preparation. Your beatitude, what does the joy of being mean to you? You have uh, inner freedom and uh, peace. 
I just want to answer to you, to your question you asked me about uh, peace. This is true that there are problems all the time, but in our church always mention peace and peace be to you, because this is what is our Lord was saying. When we talk about peace in the church, it's peace between us and God, right? What do I need a peace that is made by thanks? The very moment there is no inner peace. The real peace starts from within, correct? This is why our Lord Jesus Christ says, peace be with you, which means I am your peace. So if you put me in your hearts and your mind, then you'll be always peaceful. What are the moments in a week that make your heart skip a bit? There are moments that uh, uh, you have all sorts of commitments together, right? But again, I mean, you should not put the trust in yourself, but in Him. And if you have trust in Him, because who I am, right? What makes you think about people's spiritual life? The, when we talk about spiritual life, actually is how to try to uh, maintain as much as we can our hearts pure. The purity of the heart, this is the, I mean, this is the sacramental life of the church to help us to maintain the purity of the heart because blessed are those who are pure in the heart, they will see God. I mean, everybody loves children and is jealous of them. Why? Because of their purity, right? So this is what is actually about spiritual life. How to keep pure your heart, to clean your heart. Because we are nearing the end, we ask you your gratitude to address a word to those who are watching us. We pray God to enlighten the minds of the people and warm their hearts so that they can uh, see uh, God. I mean, when I say to see God means to see and enjoy the light of God, because as I've said, Christ says, I am the life, I am the light, uh, I am uh, the freedom. Thank you very much, your gratitude for your time and for the very clear and touching testimonies. Thank you very much and God bless you and bless the people of Romania. <laughs>